So I think uh, one of the common themes in lots of talks and presentations we see today, and I think that's maybe what also underlies all the different projects, or many different projects at Clarity Tool, is the availability of huge amounts of data and our need to figure out how to make sense of this data, right, how to create new knowledge of it, how to understand what are the gaps. Um, so we just heard about uh, data and neuroscience. Earlier we heard an amazing talk by James Fowler about analysis of social networks. And what we're doing in our lab uh, called software studies is something similar, but the data in our case is not you know, uh, recordings in the brain or uh, records of social networks, you know, physical or uh, virtual, but huge amounts of cultural content created by humans. In particular, in the modern period, photography, film, print, animation, video games, and of course, most of the content being created in the last 10 years is already digital. Right? You know, Facebook postings, Twitter, Flickr, YouTube. So what are the new things we can discover about human beings, about human imagination, about cultural differences, about cultural diversity by analyzing patterns across thousands, millions, and soon billions of cultural artifacts. Now, as um, all the work, um, it's a collaborative effort, uh, so we collaborate with different places, which give us data, but mostly we just take it ourselves from the web, uh, and uh, you know, there are lots of students from different places, besides UCSD, from as far as Moscow and Singapore, and this is the basic idea. Right. So the basic idea is to apply digital image analysis to mathematically analyze uh, characteristics of images in video, extracting uh, characteristics such as brightness, contrast, texture, and so on, and then making visualizations and statistical analysis of patterns across these characteristics. So I'm going to show you a few examples uh, of data sets. Uh, for example, all the covers of Time magazine uh, published you know, since the beginning of public, since, uh, since Time Magazine started to be published in 1923, um, over a thousand feature films over 20, uh, created over the 20th century, and our largest project at the moment, over one million of manga uh, pages and manga is uh, Japanese comics, incredibly popular around the world. Sorry. Okay, something. Okay, something's happening. That uh, Photoshop image doesn't want to go away, which is really interesting. I never saw this before. Okay, here we go. Okay. Mm hmm. Hmm. It's very bizarre. I apologize. I never saw this before. Okay. Um. Just give me one second. Okay, so for example, we can take uh, a good sample of films from 20th century, so it's about 1,100 films, and the data has not been collected by us, the data has been collected over a few years by dozens of film scholars who have painstakingly watched these films and noted the average length of an edit in all the films, right? So we collected this data, it's in the database online, so for every film, you can find out the average length of a shot, right? So if it's a, you know, a action film, average shot may be five seconds. You know, if it's a, some kind of very slow Russian or Japanese film, maybe it's a one minute. But we never thought to actually put this data on a graph. So that's what you find. Now, of course, you find some things which are not surprising, but over time, uh, the trend, right, the trend is going down, so films are getting faster. Uh, but what you can also see is which films are outwires. So here is, for example, Tarkovsky, the Russian director, Sacrifice. And here is another Russian director whom Tarkovsky, in fact, is reacting on from 1920s, man in movie camera. You also find out that right on the trend line, right in the mainstream, 
are people who in fact established contemporary film language such as Griffith or John Ford, but also independent filmmakers such as Jim Jarmusch. Okay. So uh, now here, you know, each film is represented by a dot. But probably some of you at least have seen amazing visualization systems, right, designed here at Kalati 2, such as the hyperspace on the second floor. So when I saw this hyperspace in 2005, I said, you know, why only make graphs out of points? What if I would actually include the actual images, the actual media in my visualizations, my visualizations would become much more meaningful, okay? And if Photoshop would obey me, which it doesn't want to, uh, okay, I have to, so, sorry guys, I'm not sure why it's happened. Let me just start over in this case. Let's see what happens. Okay, so let's take a relatively small data set, a number of images, sorry about that again, number of images of two 20th century painters, uh, Piet Mondrian, one of the developers of abstract art, and then the abstract artist from America, Mark Rothko, who is working about 30 years later, in the middle of 20th century, and compare them on the most kind of simple dimensions we can think of, average brightness and average, and average saturation over paintings, right? So how bright each painting is and how saturated the painting is. So we do it, and we get something like this. And you can say, Lev, you know, why are you doing it? I mean, you're a professor to CSD. I mean, I'm sure it has been done by high school students 100 years ago. You know what? Nobody has done that, right? Uh, and you know, you see amazingly complex techniques in this building, and we're also applying some of these techniques, machine learning, what have you, but we actually want high school students to do that. So what we're trying to do in our work is get hold of interesting data sets and apply not the most complex techniques, which is what engineers do, uh, but the simplest techniques. So we leave complex stuff to you guys, uh, and very often you get amazing results, right? So what you see here right away, what is very different, uh, so obviously, so uh, Mondrian is a kind of abstract artist of the first generation. He starts here with traditional paintings, very brown, and then he goes here, and then he arrived at his mature style by 1920 in this part of the space. What's interesting, and I can't show it to you here, but uh, you would see it if I would play animation, and add time dimension, 30 years later, Rovka, Mondrian, st uh, Rov sorry, Rovka starts in exactly part of a, of a space of possibility. He starts here, when he goes here and here, right? So you can see that, you know, the way kind of Mark Rothko establishes his brand and his kind of fame is by exploring certain parts of what we can call style space, the space of kind of parameter possibilities, right? Paintings which are very bright and very saturated and then paintings which are very dark, which early, early artists didn't go to. Okay, well now let's apply the same idea, but instead of analyzing, you know, 150 paintings of two artists, Let's take a larger sample. Let's look at one million pages from manga, and as I already mentioned, manga is Japanese comics, okay? And we're going to start by just looking at, you know, two images, if you've never seen kind of manga before. Uh, okay, so this is, let's say, two images, which come from different part of a kind of manga culture. So this image is from one of the top selling manga series aimed at teenage girls, okay? Uh, and uh, the image, the, the manga page on the right is from, a, from, a, from, a, from one of the top selling manga series aimed at teenage boys. And they actually have names, one is called Shonen, one is called Shoujo, and this is how manga industry in Japan divides its market, where are four categories, teenage boys, teenage girls, young men, young women. Well, if we don't use any computers and just look at these images, of course, we can see lots of various differences, right? You can probably narrate these differences. So here you have, you know, this kind of moody textures and these very dramatic lines. But can you actually do, can you actually generalize from these two images and make general statement about the style of boys, girls, of boys manga and girls manga? Of course not. Funny, that's what people in humanities always do, right? So we take incredibly small samples and generalize, and it kind of works so it worked okay so far, but now to have all this big data, we can actually do it in a more scientific way, right? Let's take a larger sample and let's compare these images. But you know, how can I compare, how am I going to compare half a million 
images for boys and half a million images for girls. I mean, I can't do it with my eye. Even if I take a smaller sample, let's take a smaller sample. So we're going to take one manga series, and this manga series, you know, we published over time. So this one has been published since 99. So every week, you know, we published a new chapter, maybe 20, 30 pages. So over 11 years, we have about 10,000 images. So one thing we can do is simply put all these images in order and look at them. And the result looks like this. Okay, so we can zoom in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And have to wait for computer, right? The computers have not been actually designed to show so many images. The result looks like this. And you know, if I look at this, I'm like, well, you know, it seems like there are some interesting moments. So here uh, in this part of a manga, you know, uh, the backgrounds got reversed. And then I see other things, and I see the strange pages. But what if you ask me a question, Lev? Over 11 years of publication of this manga series, did the visual language change? It's kind of really impossible to say, right? It's impossible to say if we just start looking for a book manually, and it's also very hard to say if you just, even if you use computers and put over pages into a single image. So what we're going to do is apply our kind of trend, our cultural analytics method which means we're going to automatically measure visual features of these images, even use these features to position the images into a DU3D D space. So then what we're doing is we're kind of mapping uh, all kinds of differences between images into distance. And our eyes are very good in estimating distances. So essentially we're going to automatically map images, right, project them into a space based on their visual characteristics. Um, so we can do it, for example, for a single title. Okay. So here is the pages from like a typical title. I think it's about maybe 2,000 pages, like organized by the visual characteristics. Uh, the images which are at the bottom. Let me see here. Yeah, wait again for computer. So the images. What happens here is the images which are at the bottom, right? Are at one extreme. You know, we have lots of white, lots of black. We don't have lots of texture, so we're very kind of black and white, and then the images which are on top are more textured and more detailed. Now, well, since we have some engineers in the audience, I can say things which I always want to say, but I wouldn't say it in front of our historians because we're going to freak out. Okay, so, the act, so actually what we're measuring is very simple, right? The y-axis is simply entropy. So images have more texture, right, more detail. Uh, it's it's more difficult to predict, right, the next pixel, so we give high entropy. And then the x-axis is simply standard deviation. So right away, what we can do is we can do two things. Yes, this allows us to compare the range of graphical expression used in this single manga series, but what's more interestingly, when we start looking at the larger samples of culture and automatically kind of visualize them by very features, we realize that our traditional cultural concepts are no longer to, going to work. Okay, so let's say I'm going to ask you to describe a style of this manga series. But is it possible to talk about here the style? Because the style ranges all over the place, right? On the one hand, we have place, we have uh, pages, you know, which are very, very graphic, right? On the other hand, like here, okay? on the other hand, we have pages, you know, which are very textured. So in fact, if you think about this kind of shape, right? Uh, and the shape is because some of these variables are correlated, right? So every, po every possible image a human being can produce, you know, whether it is photograph or drawing or cave painting, would be somewhere inside this kind of semicircle. So we can see that this, even this one single manga series occupies a very large part of a space of possibilities. And in fact, it occupies such a large part, right? The range in style between the upper images and the lower images are so large that in fact the whole concept of a style goes out the window, right? Well, things get of course even more interesting if we scale it up. So now let's take a whole sample of one million images and visualize it in the same way. So of course we can combine it with different features and we can use various techniques of multivariable statistics, but let's just stick to you know, one feature per axis. Okay, and let me see, now I, I do need Photoshop because this image is very large. So only Photoshop can really open this properly. So let's see if we get lucky. And of course, you know, when I project one million images on top of each other, you're not going to see the density 
of this plot. So I'm also going to show another image, which is just using points, so you can see the kind of density of this distribution. Okay, here we are. Okay. So if we look at this, and let's see what happened. Did we get this? We didn't get this one. Just to do it first. Okay, here we go. Right. So this is uh, all this data, right? Simply projected these points, right? And you can also ri see right away why be able to make visualizations which actually show you the actual images as opposed to points is more meaningful. Yeah, this is fantastic, and I can talk about statistical properties of this data set, but I actually don't know what these points really are, right? All I know is that, you know, there is many more points in the center, and there is a kind of fall-off on both sides. Well, here I can actually see what these points represent, right? So it's exactly the same mapping as before. I'm kind of keeping the same mapping throughout this example so we don't get confused. But now, because we're dealing with one million images, a larger space of possibilities is filled in, right? So it's the same thing as we saw before, except now the space is filled in in a more dense manner, right? So again, the images which are very schematic are in the lower right corner, and the images you know, which are very dramatic, so which are very, very textured, are in the upper part, okay? And what you see here is even more than in the previous example is that it appears, if you think about culture as a kind of evolution, you know, and think of evolution which produces all kinds of animals, right, with strange limbs, so the evolution is also exploring this parameter space, we can say that in this case, the artistic evolution or the media evolution, whatever we want to call it, has filled in practically every possibility, right, in the large part of this parameter space to such extent that the concept of style just completely goes out the window. Now, I think I uh, should be finishing up, right? So let me just make one last image. So of course, this is just the beginning. So now, using this, using this kind of method, using this representation, you can start asking all kinds of new questions. For example, well, let's, for, let's say we're not going to be talking about style. Let's say we'll be talking about instead about the range of parameters, right, or the distributions of the distributions. So what is the distribution of graphical expression for boys' comics and for girl comics? How different are they? Right? So notice when you, know, when you look at just first two images, you look at the two images, which we looked before, just these two. Uh, let me see, and here we are, right? Well, you know, oh, sorry, guys, I apologize. Uh, I'll be finishing one second. Yes, yeah, so, so if we just look at these two images again, you know, we look very, very different. But how typical are they, right? Well, uh, what I'm going to do is simply, uh, for the la last slide, is to go back to the points and uh, just show you sort of one last image where, um, not this one, but this one, okay, where we basically reduced each manga series to its average and plotted them in the same space, right? So you have uh, 883 manga series. So again, it's the same representation, but instead of showing you every image, we now took the average. And the red points in the left graphs are the manga for, young, for teenage boys, and here are manga for teenage girls. And what you see here right away is that, yes, you do have two distributions. Yes, we have different centers, but they're kind of fuzzy, right? We have a kind of, we have a kind of overlapping boundaries, and they very strongly overlap. So what we're now doing is kind of using this approach with our cultural data sets and trying to understand what, it, what we're going to find about cultural categories in general, because it turns out that our cultural categories, such as, for example, genre, also overlaps, right? So uh, this is a visualization uh, where we took uh, metadata information provided by fans. So fans have tagged every manga series using up to 31 tags for different genres it turns out that every single type of genre is applied to boys and to girls, and also we all connect it, right? So even though, yes, mostly boys, mostly boys like action, and mostly girls like romance, boys also like romance. So it turns out that perhaps genre, which is, seems to be such an obvious category to talk about culture, also is a fuzzy category, which perhaps should be actually replaced by something else. Guys, thank you so much. This is just a little window uh, to be continued. Thank you.